Hello and welcome to Enroute, the podcast where we talk about life along the way. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. Make sure to visit our website at enroutepodcast.org and there you can subscribe to the show in various um, pod, uh, podcast platforms such as Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or via RSS so you will not miss a show. And, you know, don't just listen to the show. Leave a review. Leave a review on whatever platform that you listen to this podcast because it's important. When you do that, it makes it a lot easier for other people to find this show. And by the way, did you know that Enroute has a YouTube channel? If you check our show notes, um, you will find a link. And so, and once you're there, subscribe and you won't miss a show. Well, I want to start by telling you a story. On a late summer morning in 1977, seven-year-old me stood in front of the television watching history being made. On television, I saw this Boeing 747. It was flying over the California desert with a special passenger strapped to its roof, the Space Shuttle Enterprise. In a few minutes' time, the test shuttle was going to separate from the jumbo jet for its first test flight. Now, as the Enterprise was sitting atop the 747, I was waiting and seeing for waiting for that moment when it was going to basically separate and glide through the air. And it, it did glide through the air because the Enterprise didn't have any engines. So, of course, when that moment happened, it basically did do just that. It glided across the California sky for a number of minutes on its own until it made a landing on a dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Now, I've always had a fascination with space exploration. There is something awesome about hearing humanity's attempt to escape escape the bonds of Earth and fly into the great unknown, and even just to try to answer that question of what's out there and by sending out um, both manned and unmanned um, missions to planets both near and far. I have been fascinated especially by um, the early space race, the, the journey to the moon, uh, Skylab, um, of course, the space shuttle program. But, you know, I've, I'm coming to appreciate and um, the unmanned missions. And we space exploration has been incredibly fertile when it comes to unmanned missions, especially those missions to Mars that we have all seen over the years, from Viking 1 back in the 70s to Perseverance earlier this year, we are given this bird's eye view of our nearest neighbor. And we can't forget the space probes like Voyager that continue to give us pictures of planets far away and and is now continuing going far, far um, beyond the known space. Now, space exploration can seem like a waste of time to some people. Those people tend to think that the money could be better spent. But I think that they're missing how both manned and unmanned space exploration can be better, can can better not just the United States, but all of humanity. I spoke with Michael Siegel, he is an astronomer um, he in, in Pennsylvania, and we talked about the importance of space exploration, what it means for science and what it means for the wider public. We also talked about something that we share in common, both having experienced the giant radio telescope at Arecibo, Puerto Rico, which sadly collapsed last year. Finally, in our discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about covid talking a little bit about the Delta variant and how best to reach the unvaccinated. With that, here is Michael Siegel.
Well, Michael, I'd like to thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I, I, I really like the work you do, so I'm uh, honored to be here. Well, great. Thank you. Well, the first thing I wanted to do is talk about um, the space program. Mm -hmm. um, even though I'm probably not, um, not science was never always my, um, I and science never seem to get along you know, for some reason, but I've always loved uh, the space program and have, been, have found an interest in it. And you recently wrote an article um, kind of talking about the, the criticism that has been happening um, with um, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos as they're going into, sp um, going into space and um, people thinking that it's a waste of money. Um, how would you explain your position about that? And why, is, why does it matter that these people are, are taking the initiative? Well, I think one of the things that, you know, let's back up a step. I think space policy for the country on a national level needs to be a little less oriented around, let's get to the moon, let's get to Mars and so forth, and more oriented around infrastructure and building up capabilities. And one of those priorities should be getting things into orbit cheaper. It's extremely expensive, I think $10,000 a pound or so to get things into orbit. And that's extremely limiting on what we can do scientifically or as a society. And if you could cut that cost significantly, that would make everything we do in space cheaper. And it's not just about sending probes to Mars. There's a lot of practical stuff we do in space, the GPS system and so forth. And a lot of science we do that's critical to uh, life on earth. And so if you can make those kind of breakthroughs that would make space travel cheaper, that's a really good thing. Now, I don't know that the billionaires are going to do that. I mean, it, it, right now it's very much on, you know, sort of a race of, oh, I got into space first, oh, I got higher and so forth. But that kind of outside the box thinking outside of NASA structure could produce the kind of breakthroughs we need to make space travel cheaper. And it's one of the few areas where I think billionaires have some leverage to improve things. You know, a lot of people say, well, they should be working on poverty or global warming and stuff like that. And I mean, obviously I agree those are huge problems, but they are massive problems. You know, we, if we took all of Jeff Bezos's money, that would be a fraction of what we spend fighting poverty every year or on the environment. And so it would, it would help a little bit, but it wouldn't make that huge a difference because those are huge social and political problems and we've discovered, you know, recently billionaires are kind of ill-suited to, to uh, addressing those kind of problems. Uh, but if we, you know, Jeff Bezos, the entire NASA budget would be a tenth of his wealth. So it's an area where a billion here, a billion there, if you could produce those kind of breakthroughs, it could make a big difference. And ultimately has a sort of, if especially if you can make space travel cheaper, it has a force multiplier effect on the money the taxpayers are spending to, to put these up. In my uh, job, I work on a space mission. I work on a space telescope, the SWIFT mission. And whenever we plan a space telescope mission, the launch is one of the most expensive parts. Building and maintaining the spacecraft is expensive, but the launch is one of the, the big expenses that you have. So if you can get a, to a point where that's significantly cheaper, that means NASA could do more space telescopes. It means we could do more sophisticated space telescopes. It, it means we could do more with the ones we have. So that's where I think the billionaires have this niche where they can potentially make it easier for us to get and cheaper to get into space and be that force multiplier NASA needs to really excel in what it does. Why do you think that it's taken a while or at least for NASA to really get the cost down? I think I remember one of the, the criticisms of the space shuttle program was just how expensive it was for per launch and that it wasn't as quickly reusable as they, they mm -hmm. were, it was sold as. What do you think is, has been behind that? Um, I think there are several issues. Part of it is fundamental. I mean, it's with the laws of physics, it's difficult to get things into space. And, you know, you are, when you put things into space, sort of at the tyranny of the, what we call the rocket equation. Mm -hmm. That as a, as a payload gets bigger, you have to build a bigger rocket, but that makes the rocket heavier, which means you need a bigger rocket, which makes it heavier and so forth. And so the, the expense of putting up into things goes up exponentially with the mass. But I, it's also that NASA 
is very risk averse. They want to use technology they know is going to work or at least has a very good chance of working. Now that has changed a little bit over the last few decades where they're willing to take a few more chances, like especially with the Mars landers, that was, you know, that, that took a big risk, but it paid off very well. But a lot of the times, you know, NASA really doesn't want things to fail. And they know that they have people in Congress that if they spend $5 billion on a new rocket technology, it doesn't work out, they're gonna get raked over the coals for it. Whereas if Jeff Bezos blow, blows a few billion dollars on a technology that doesn't work, no one's gonna care. So I, I do think NASA likes to stick to things that they know are gonna work, likes, likes to, you know, they have a very, for them, I mean, it's, I don't wanna say it's a small budget because it's, a, a, you know, $20 billion, but they have a very tight budget. And so they need to focus on the things that they are sure of, that uh, are very, they know are space worthy. And risk assessment is a very big part of any space mission. You know, how likely is this to fail? How likely is this to work? Has the technology been tested in space and so forth? And so um, they do things with a certain way. It's very successful uh, the way they do things, but it also only leaves a small wedge for innovation that, uh, that fortunately, you know, there are people within the program who have innovated and we have made progress in the last few decades in improving things. But, you know, outside the box ideas like a reusable rocket, which uh, SpaceX is using, that was not something that they were as really on their radar because of the, of the risks involved. But Elon Musk was able to spend some money on it and it's working pretty, pretty well. So is the risk averse nature part of the reason we're kind of using the, we're talking about the space launch system, which is in many ways, something derived from the space shuttle itself. Mm -hmm. They didn't really want to try to risk trying something new as a system to get people to the moon. Um, I, that's, yeah, I think that's part of it, that you like to use the technologies that you understand that you know are going to work. And especially when you're talking about manned spaceflight where lives are at stake, then you really, uh, have a tendency to make sure everything works, make sure we've done this before and so forth. A lot of the technology that we use in space missions has been tested on you know, smaller missions before, rocket flights, balloon flights, that sort of thing, before, or CubeSats before it goes you know, for prime time. Do you think that the risk averse nature comes from maybe a larger viewpoint of society has become risk averse or is it just something internal to NASA itself? I think it's, it's a general thing with government programs that they like to, to, to do things a certain way. But, you know, I mean, I say risk averse, space travel is inherently risky. Um, so we, you, it's a, not a matter of wanting everything to be safe. It's a matter of managing the risks that you're taking. Mm -hmm. You know, when we put those two, the most recent landers on Mars, you know, this was a very complicated process to land these on Mars because they were very heavy and Mars has a thin atmosphere. So they had to, you may have seen the video of the seven minutes of terror that they did of how they, mm -hmm. how they do this. That was a very risky and it was very bold to, to do that. But, you know, that's within sort of a, a sort of box where we're comfortable taking those kind of risks. Whereas outside people like Bezos might be able to risk things that NASA would not want to risk because we think the odds of it succeeding are low. One of the things that I've always been interested in is the um, the Indian space program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what has always fascinated me about um, their program is, I mean, they've done a lot of, of kind of what it seems miraculous things go, and getting to Mars basically on their first try. But I think the fascinating thing is that they do this for a, maybe a fraction of the cost of what NASA is doing. Mm -hmm. Is that a model that we could follow or is that, or is what they do specific to the context of India itself? I think it's probably more specific to their context. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have more human resources, you have uh, it, you know, it's technologies that have been established by other space programs. You know, a lot of what NASA does is researching new technologies and, and figuring these things out. Um, you have, you know, lower salaries than what you would have here. You know, humans are the most important part of a mission and also one of the biggest expenses you have. Um, 
So I don't think it's necessarily scalable to the United States. There's certainly lessons we could learn, and I'm sure NASA is looking at lessons we can learn from mm -hmm. uh, how they save money. But you, you want to be very careful in, in how you do that. And I think one of the other things is now we, um, with our, with the kind of program that we are doing with NASA, um, with private um, space uh, companies, um, is going back to the moon. Um, where do you think that companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are helpful with the Artemis program? And where do you think that there may be problems? Um, I'm hesitant to talk about that because I'm not terrifically familiar with what they're doing. Okay. Um, I do know a little bit because we've, we've had some conversations with uh, engineers here about some of the challenges. Um, let me think about this. Getting, getting things to the moon safely is a huge challenge. I mean, we've had, you talked about the Indian space program and they had a probe that crashed and mm -hmm. the yeah. rocket didn't work. And um, certainly there is some room for technological innovation, particularly on you know, the reliability angle. I mean, we got, we were very fortunate with the Apollo program that you know, the one time things went wrong, we were able to return the, the astronaut safely. But, you know, for example, when the Apollo astronauts, when the Apollo 11 mission went to the moon, Nixon had a statement prepared for if the astronauts died mm -hmm. because he knew and NASA understood how risky the mission was. Um, and so I do think there is some space there for them to, not necessarily with technological innovation, but for reliability and safety and expense of helping pave some roads that NASA can then follow. Because a lot of times, you know, I said, you know, the billionaires have a, have a window. If they can prove a technology works, then NASA can come in and develop and enhance that technology and we can uh, potentially make a huge progress. So uh, a moon mission and a moon colony are one of those things that's right now tremendously expensive and one of those places where we need breakthroughs in getting things into orbit. We need breakthroughs in landing things on the moon. We need breakthroughs in running automated processes on the moon because probably if we had a moon colony, probably the way we do it is land robotic um, instruments that would then do the construction before humans even got there and so forth. So there's a lot of technological innovation that needs to happen before that, before we can actually get there. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, NASA is exploring it from their direction. I think there is some room for these other private industries to explore from their window, maybe in more innovative stuff or risky stuff, you know, to to see if they can make some breakthroughs that could help. Probably one of the the most basic questions about the space program is, why do you think it we have not been back to the moon since 1972? Um, well, I mean, the, I think the bigger question. I mean, we went there because we were in a competition, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. And we've found that most of the science that we want to do can be done by automated probes. It's also, as I said, very expensive and, and risky to, to get to the moon. And we've been very focused on very practical things, you know, satellites, GPS satellites, communication satellites, weather satellites, and so forth. I think um, you would have to reinvent a lot of what we are doing from scratch, which is mm -hmm. what you know, we've seen over and over again. But I also think there's been a problem politically in that we have an administration come in and they say, well, we want to go to Mars and NASA orients everything towards Mars. And then the next administration says, well, we want to go to the moon. And so they reorient everything. And I think that shifting vision has a tendency to, you know, waste resources and time mm -hmm. on, you know, planning and trying to figure out how we're doing things rather than setting a goal. I mean, we started the Apollo, you know, the steps that led us to the moon started in the, in the late 1950s, early 60s. And Kennedy said we were going to the moon in 1963. And it was six years before we got there, but we had basically unlimited money and a willingness to take that risk that it wasn't gonna work. And for Russia, it didn't work. Their moon rocket blew up on the launch pad and they never made it. I think that without that competition, we sort of lost interest and became more interested in worthy goals, you know, space science, uh, monitoring the climate, that sort of thing, very practical things. I think that if 
again, if we can make those breakthroughs, it makes the moon more affordable and more practical and less risky, then we, we can go back. I think that space policy would be, is best focused on building capabilities and then seeing what we can do with them. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I talked several times about getting things into orbit, making it cheaper because that's the biggest force multiplier. You know, the, the uh, another um, technology they need to work on is radiation protection. You know, if you're gonna have astronauts in space for a long time, they're exposed to cosmic radiation. How do you shield them? How do you keep them alive? These are baseline problems that are applicable to any space mission, to the space station, to a moon mission, to Mars, to whatever we wanna do. And I think that we need to be less focused on things like the moon or Mars and more focused on the kind of capabilities to build up so that those missions become practical and do more practical, and more doable, rather than saying, we wanna put a flag on Mars. Mm -hmm. How, um, I'm trying to figure out how to put, put this right, but how do you think the things like the Mars rovers, all the, the various ones in the 90s and through up until Perseverance have been helpful um, to the space program. I, and I ask that question because I think sometimes people don't think that those things are, are that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember actually watching um, Perseverance and but I was actually more interested in seeing what the people um, in launch control were looking at and, and just their excitement when it finally mm -hmm. made it. Um, how important is that to I to think the home? Mars program in my lifetime has become one of NASA's big stories. Mm -hmm. There was a time when Mars was considered a jinxed planet because we had, we and the Russians had numerous missions fail uh, on reaching there. There was one extremely embarrassing one where one part of the group was doing their calculations in metric and the other was an imperial and the result was I think I remember crashed. that. But since then, since like the mid to late 90s, it's been a string of successes. And I think one, they've been tremendously advanced and they've been amazing for science. I mean, what we have learned about Mars in the last 20 years, I mean, I taught, I occasionally teach, so I taught Astro One in the fall. The Astro One lecture I gave last fall was radically different from the one I gave when I was a graduate student 25 years earlier because we have learned so much. We now know there's water on Mars. We know there were oceans in early Mars. And I think it, within my lifetime, we will find evidence that there was at least the building blocks of life on Mars. You know, Maybe not anything sophisticated, but archaea or bacteria or something like that, something on that level existed there, which would be one of the most profound discoveries NASA has ever made. And they've had, you know, I've seen that these missions, especially Curiosity and Perseverance have you know, sort of fired the imagination with the way they landed on Mars. There's been a lot of excitement in the broader community, not just among astronomers, but in just people who like space and are interested in that. And uh, I think the Mars missions have been one of the biggest highlights, I think, of NASA in the last 20 years, just with their success and their discoveries and really going above and beyond, you know, like I think, uh, the early rovers, their mission timeline was 90 days and they lasted for years. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I find as someone who works for a space mission, the public really loves when they've put up the money and they get way more bang for their buck than we, we promised. I think that's something that really makes the public happy. They feel like their money's being well spent. They feel like we're learning things. They feel like we're exploring the universe. I think that really fires up excitement. I do a lot of public outreach and especially to kids and showing them pictures of Mars, telling them about how the Mars rovers work. That's always, that's never unpopular. <laughs> that's <laughs> always something they're, they're gonna love and something that really fires the imagination and inspires people. I mean, one of the things Andrew and I talked about was how when the Apollo missions went off, they inspired a lot of people to get into science, not necessarily into <laughs> being an astronaut or even into space, but being involved in science. And I think that the Mars missions have that inspirational effect of people not necessarily going into space or becoming astronauts or astronomers even, but just you know maybe becoming engineers, maybe becoming communicators, that sort of thing. And so I, I think that uh, you know even though we haven't put people on Mars, putting those probes on Mars is really wonderful scientifically and for the public at large. 
And related to that, how how do you think that the space program has benefited our society? I mean, it I, and I would agree with you. I think it has helped spur interest in science and. Um, but what other changes do you think have been affected by by the program? I think that, um, I mean, there's a technological innovation. Uh, a lot of the technologies we use for going into space have practical applications back on Earth. You know, much of our medical science, for example, like remote sensing was advanced by the Apollo program because they needed to monitor the astronauts' health in space. And it turned out, oh, hey, we can monitor people on Earth without sticking needles in their bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's that side of it. Um, there's, as you said, the inspiration. Um, I also think, you know, one of the things that I remember, I think it was either, ha maybe even Chris Hadfield said that he sometimes wishes everyone could go into space and see the earth from there mm -hmm. because it gives people a perspective on the conflicts and disagreements we have on here. It gives them that perspective that we are, you know, one people really, you know, and, I think that it unfortunately hasn't had this effect, but the potential for space exploration to be sort of this unifying thing of giving people a perspective on something just beyond the day to day. You know, I mean, it can't all be about increasing the GDP 0.1% in the next quarter. There has to be a narrative. There has to be some inspiration. There has to be some point to the human story. And I think that the space program in its way gives people that sort of point that we are making progress. There is something what we are doing that is beyond just the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, I think one of the things that has always been fascinating to me is the connection between um, space and religion. Um, mm -hmm. And being a pastor, of course, that fascinates me. And, you know, one of the most I think meaningful moments in for me in the space program was um, and this happened before I was born, but I just remember seeing that the pictures of it is Apollo 8 um, in 1968 and seeing the earth rise and one of the astronauts reading from the first chapter of Genesis, the creation story. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Buzz Aldrin, yeah. when he landed on the moon, mm -hmm. uh, he took communion. Communion he on the a, moon, he yes. A, he had a priest make him a little cup and all that. He, he said to Neil Armstrong, I think this is the moment is so important that we should commemorate it this way. Yeah, and I think that that is fascinating because I, at least for me, I think space really does open you up to something larger than yourself um, and up into the cosmos. And I think that there is this, this connection between our faith and then outer space and what does that mean? Because I think then it, that launches into other questions about who are mm -hmm. we and what is our role and all of that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, astronomers as a group probably are less religious than the public as a whole. Mm -hmm. But there are some astronomers to whom that connection between the cosmos and religion, faith is very strong. Um, Alan Sandage uh, was one of those who, who talked a lot about that. Um, because he, I mean, he was a great cosmologist, and one of the things he said was, the one question science can't answer is why is there something instead of nothing. You know, um, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, another great uh, scientist and great public communicator, you know, she's a, a Quaker, I believe. You know, her faith is very important to her. So there are those who see that that connection between the two. One other question that I've always had, um, and I've had it even more lately, just because I've I've seen some videos and learned a little bit about um, the uh, Venture Star program, um, which was a replacement for the space shuttle, a proposed replacement for the space shuttle is, um, why do you think the NASA never really came up with something to replace the shuttle? Um, it looks like there were several attempts throughout, um, I think, especially throughout the 90s, but it never came to fruition. Um, shifting priorities, as I said before, they, they tend to rob programs, but also there's been a sort of a rethink of the way things should work mm -hmm. in that respect, that putting humans and cargo on the same vehicle isn't really a, a great idea, um, that <laughs> lately what you've seen is that we tend to launch like 
things for the space station and so forth on a rocket and then you can send humans up in a capsule to rendezvous with it. And I think you're probably gonna see more of that in the future where we have cargo ships and then human ships. Okay. Um, where, um, I mean, I talked about the moon earlier, how you might send a robotic mission there to establish, if you wanted to establish a colony, you'd send a robotic mission there to build, do the initial construction and then send humans to work there. And so I think that's one of the disconnects that uh, uh, has, uh, has happened in that if you were starting from scratch today, the shuttle would probably not be the program you would do simply mm -hmm. because you would wanna put cargo and in, in humans on, this, on different places. Now that does close off certain things. I mean, one of the advantages of the shuttle for my profession was that it allowed the astronauts to launch space telescopes and with Hubble to service it. Uh, but you don't really need that at this point. I think uh, even the shuttle demonstrated that they could rendezvous with a prior launch satellite and do repairs. The first one they did it with the Solar Max back in the 80s. And so uh, I think you're probably gonna see more emphasis on heavy launch vehicles that launch things into space and capsule vehicles that launch humans into space. So you don't think that you'll see, we'll see another type of space plane in the, in the future? Not, not like the shuttle, not which has okay. that big cargo bay. Maybe mm -hmm. one that has lots of people on it, you know, that can have more passengers, but not in that respect, because I think uh, having a separate launch vehicle for cargo and people makes a bit more sense in that context. Okay. Well, switching to something a little bit more terrestrial, is to talk about um, something that is, um, I think we both have a connection to, and that's the um, Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, my mom is from Puerto Rico and she would tell me about this. And, um, and I visited it in 2012, um, was just kind of awed by just how big it was. And, but also really the, the connection that it had to the island itself and that it really does, did inspire people, kids on the island to become scientists. And so it, it seemed like a big important symbol. And so of course, when it collapsed in December, that was heartbreaking, I think for a lot of people. Um, I guess since you have that connection with Arecibo as well, um, and if you can kind of talk a little bit about that is, how important was the radio telescope to the scientific community as a whole? And, and what has been um, the significance of its loss? It was uh, very important. I mean, it, one of the largest radio telescopes in the world and you know, made enormous discoveries. Of the, for example, the uh, binary pulsar, which won a Nobel Prize about 20 years ago, is a two shriveled husk of dead stars orbiting around each other every few seconds. And by measuring how fast that orbit was decaying, we were able to test Einstein's theory of relativity and prove that uh, he was correct in uh, the idea of gravitational radiation, which eventually paved the path for LIGO and the discovery of gravitational waves and so forth. And that's just one of the discoveries it made. I mean, it was this incredible survey instrument. Uh, my experience, my personal experience was I was an undergraduate in Minnesota at Carleton, uh, which you might uh, be familiar mm -hmm. with. There. Yes. Uh, and I was doing research uh, processing data from the very large array in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so one day uh, in February, uh, my roommate woke me up and said, hey, my car's stuck in the snow. Can you sit on the trunk to give it a little extra weight to help it get out of the snow? So literally freezing my butt off, I go into uh, the observatory and my professor says, hey, Mike, I have a observing run coming up at Puerto Rico. I can't do it. Do you think you could go? <laughs> You're going to twist my arm Puerto like that, Joe. Minnesota, <laughs> Puerto Rico. Yeah. I don't think about this. <laughs> so I, I went there and um, I was working with a postdoc and we were doing a survey of pulsars. Mm -hmm. And um, these are, again, the shriveled husks of dead stars. And as they spin, their magnetic pole flashes over the earth. So it's like a lighthouse. And... Um, and you can observe during the day. So we had at one point a 30 hour session on the telescope. So I had to, at one point, middle of the night, 20 years old, I'm running the biggest telescope in the world. And you, know, you punch in the coordinates and you see the big antenna shift in the sky, shift. And then you see the oscilloscope go crazy because you're on the right telescope target. And it was amazing. And it was my first observing run. And as an astronomer, 
when you do observing runs, you know, it's like three in the morning and you feel like you're the only person in the world who's awake. So it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. So um, that's what it, it meant to me personally. That, and that really, I wasn't sure I was gonna go into astronomy and that sort of uh, drew me in uh, to stay. Um, so that's what it means to me personally. But for the community, it, it meant a lot in terms of the scientific capability, the history of the instrument, you know, its iconic status. I mean, it made cameo appearances mm -hmm. in movie, action movies and so forth and so forth. So I do hope, I mean, we need, we could really use that capability back. So I do hope, and a lot of the astronomy communities behind the idea of, of rebuilding it with an even better instrument uh, and so forth. And it was refurbished many times over the course of its, of its life. Um, so it was, it was very up-to-date and modern with its uh, capabilities. So, and Puerto Rico being further south is kind of ideally suited to that kind of instrument because it, it can scan a large part of the sky and so forth. So I will see, it will be a while before we know, but I'm really hoping that the uh, energy of the community will be behind uh, rebuilding that, not just because of the location and the science, but because there were a lot of people in that era who are experts mm -hmm. in that, um, who, uh, you know, we have a ready-made workforce that can run that telescope, that can get the most out of the science we can. And so I, I really hope we, that we get that back at some point. Yeah, I was actually going, that was actually going to be my next question is, is there any type of move to try to find a, um, a way of replacing it, building something at that spot or? Um, I think it's too early to know at this stage. Yeah. And, but I think there's certainly a lot of energy in the community that would support that. It depends on what money is available and what uh, NSF and other organizations can do. But I, I certainly think uh, that that's something that we hope will happen. And did you ever have another chance to go to Arecibo after that? I, I did not. Um, yeah. I went to the University of Virginia to do radio astronomy, but I ended up going into optical astronomy. Okay. So I, I did not get a chance to go back. All right. Well, as I said earlier, it was kind of an awe-inspiring event to see um, this telescope. And yeah, I, I, it, is. it is. No, nothing can prepare you. No. You no. can see it on the movies. Nothing can prepare you for seeing in person just how massive that thing was. Yeah. And so it just kind of, it, it was it was surprising to hear, you know, what had happened. And I think that, you know, it probably just a lot of kind of weird things that happened that just made it less stable um, mm -hmm. than they it could, that they really just couldn't keep it up. Yeah, and, I think it was damaged in a hurricane and there was talk yes. of decommissioning it and then it just it just collapsed, made the yeah. decision for us. Well, the other thing that we wanted to kind of close out with is um, COVID. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've been talking about that as well. And um, the news as of late, of course, uh, has been, of course, the, um, the Delta variant and that that's now really kind of the um, number one kind of way of people of getting COVID um, in the United States right now. Um, there are, it seems like early on when we were getting um, the vaccinations, we were doing really well. And um, I would say that we still, I mean, we have a good chunk of the population that has been vaccinated, but we're now at this point where things have slowed down considerably. Do you think that the reason that's happening is because of anti-vaxxers or is it more that it's been harder for people that we're kind of down to the population that it's harder to, to get them to, to places where they can I, get I think vaccinated? The, I think it's more the latter. Anti-vaxxers, I mean, one of the problems with the internet and the news cycle we have is that small loud voices get amplified mm -hmm. and there are anti-vaxxers on TV and on the internet and so forth. But I think a lot of people are just vaccine hesitant. You know, these are new vaccines and a lot of people, you know, they can't afford to take time off from work, you know, not just to get the vaccine, but to recover from having the vaccine because some, because a lot of times you get sick for a day or two. I think a lot of people just, you know, they've heard sort of vague things about risk and, and so forth. There is a growing body of evidence that, it, that if you go and talk to people and answer their questions and have the vaccine there so that they can make a decision that they're more willing to listen. And I know I personally have persuaded a couple of vaccine hesitant people to get the vaccine um, because, you know, I, I basically talked to them and, they, and I said, well, all right, well, what are your concerns and what do you want to know about them? And I'm not, 
in any way an expert. I'm in you know, astrophysics, but I know enough that I could talk to people, knowledge be, and at least point them to resources where they could read up on it and, and figure out what's going on. And I actually am kind of optimistic. Um, there are preliminary indications that vaccination rates are coming up. Some of the companies mm. that make them are reporting that demand has spiked recently. I think because of the Delta variant, because we are seeing numbers surge. And a lot of people are like, all right, I don't have a choice anymore. I, I need to get this done. So I think uh, you know it's fun to engage the anti-vaxxers on Twitter and so forth, but I think the vast majority of the people who are unvaccinated right now are just are just hesitant because it's new technology, it's a new vaccine, it's still under under sort of an emergency use use authorization. You know they've heard vague things about side effects and so forth, and a lot of people still have this sort of mentality that well you know it's low risk and so forth, whereas even though the risk of dying is about 1%, the risk of long COVID and long-term damage is, is significant. So I think as the conversation progresses, if people can engage those who are more willing to listen and, and have, you know, I think really serious and uh, legitimate questions about whether they should get vaccinated. I think the more we engage those people and, you know, sort of let the anti-vaxxers do their thing, the more progress we will make. And I think, uh, we are going to see hopefully vaccination rates come up because it seems like a lot of the community is getting behind this idea of engaging people, answering their questions, listening to their concerns, you know, treating those concerns. And some of them are legitimate. I mean, the vaccine does, you know, the vaccines can have side effects. They do have risks. I don't think we should ignore that. But pointing out that those risks and side effects are way lower than COVID itself, I think is the, is the way we approach that. Um, I think that there is progress to be made here. And I think that uh, the vast majority of the public is willing to listen. The, the, the ones who haven't been vaccinated are willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And the more yeah. we are reasonable about their concerns, the more unreasonable the anti-vaxxers look. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, when I got my um, shot, one of the things that has been, I'm, I always have, when I was younger, I used to take um, shots for allergies. And I would usually have to wait half hour just to make sure I didn't have a reaction to them. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that history and because of, you know, I didn't know there are certain things that I'm allergic to that I didn't know, you know, you have to wait a half hour. Um, so, I mean, there are risks to those things, but it does seem like trying to kind of explain, you know, what, how great of a risk they are, what it, all of that can can go a long longer way than being angry at someone. It seems. Yep. And I think the pandemic, I mean, it's been frustrating in some ways, but it's also been inspiring in some ways because of the trust that the public has placed in science. I mean, mm -hmm. many of the concepts we talk, we've had to talk about with COVID are pretty complicated things. And the public has engaged those. I mean, Millions of people wear masks, millions of people stayed at home, I mean, millions of people taken the vaccine. The trust that the public has placed in science has been pretty inspiring to see. And I think that continuing down that road of inspiring that trust, you know, fulfilling that trust, making sure that that trust is not misplaced, being honest with the public about what we don't know, about the risks, about the complications, about where our thinking is now, what we've gotten wrong in the past, what we may be wrong about now, I think that sort of thing is a is a really good way to approach this, and you know basically not talk down to the public. You know, I mean, people may not be experts in science, but they're not stupid. You know, talking to them like they're stupid is not going to make any progress. Engaging them like they are intelligent, reasonable people who have legitimate questions and can understand these concepts if you explain them, I think is the way to go. And thankfully, we seem to be moving more towards that on the vaccine side rather than just trying to shame and people and just say, look, get the vaccine to say, look, what questions do you have? What concerns do you have? Let's talk about it. So what do you think, um, just concerning the Delta variant, um, where do you think that that's headed? Is, is that a concern for those of us who have already been vaccinated? Is it more of a concern for those who are unvaccinated? And is it, have we seen it peaked or is it, do we have a ways before that um, kind of wave um, dissipates? It's hard to tell at this point. I mean, certainly the risk to the unvaccinated is massively greater than the risk to the vaccinated. 
Um, we are showing now that in Canada and the UK, the vaccines are about 80, 90% effective. Um, Israel was claiming lower, but they actually figured out that was a bias in the way they were analyzing the data. So they're saying that they do now think it's very effective. And, you know, certainly, I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding. The vast majority of people who are in the hospitals, and then almost everyone who is dying is unvaccinated or, or had only one dose. And so I think, um, you know, Delta is very scary. It's, you know, and especially in parts of the world where there haven't been a lot of vaccines like India and, and so forth, it's, it's really running wild. I mean, because it's so much more infectious than the original strain. And in some ways we were kind of, I hate to say we were lucky with the original COVID, but it could, it's an example that it could have been much worse. If we'd gotten the Delta variant right out of the box, it would have been a nightmare. And you are talking about very serious consequences and you know that those you know one or two million dead Americans would have been a real thing. Um, so we've been very fortunate. I think that one of the things we should learn from Delta is that getting vaccines out into the rest of the world is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, if it costs, I mean, these vaccines are not terribly expensive. It were to, if it were to cost a hundred billion dollars to vaccinate the entire world against COVID, that's a tiny fraction of what we lost economically when the when the pandemic hit. And I think that the more you vaccinate people, the fewer variants we're going to get. The less this is going to spread, the few, less variants are going to come to our shores. And so I think one of the lessons that we've learned is that we can't just isolate the United States. I mean, you know, this thing broke out in China and quickly spread to the United States. And the Delta variant, you know, I think originally broke out in India and variants have broken out in the UK and South Africa. And there's now one in Peru and so forth. You know, we can't close our borders and protect ourselves against. We have to engage it globally. And so, yes, we should prioritize vaccinating people in the United States, but we also need long-term to be thinking about how do we get these vaccines to the rest of the world? How do we get mm -hmm. the rest of the world to believe us that these vaccines are safe and that they should be taken? You know, how do we, you know, it's a global pandemic. How do we approach this globally? What do you think about the um, advice for people to, um, especially in areas where there are high um, rates of infection to to mask. Um, this is a, a kind of a not a mandate, but a suggestion coming from the CDC, and this comes a few for, months after. Yeah, they, I think so for don't... indoor activities, it's it's justified. Okay, I mean the science that masks prevent the spread of the disease is pretty good. The science of whether mandates work is very uncertain mm -hmm. because people tend to sort of judge for themselves whether to mask or not. I think the recommendation is sound. We know. That, you know, I mean, let's say that the vaccines are 90% effective and only one in 10 vaccinated people will get it. Where you're for that lucky one in 10, you can spread it to many people in a short period of time. And so that's, that's sort of the logic here of having vaccinated people wear masks when they're un around unvaccinated people, especially indoors. Outdoors, it's, it's probably more safe because the vaccine, the virus disperses, it doesn't appear to spread outdoors, although we're still learning about Delta, that may not be the case as much anymore. But I think wearing masks indoors seems to be a, a legitimate recommendation. I don't think that mandates are necessarily going to come down because a lot of people are kind of resistant to that, but making those recommendations and saying, look, you know, you don't want to be the reason someone caught COVID, mm -hmm. I think is, is, is reasonable. And wearing masks indoors, I mean, this, I realize that this is a very fraught debate, you know, with, with people, but I, I don't think it's a, that big a, a burden for a lot of people. And so I, I think it's a reasonable way of protecting those who either aren't vaccinated or can't be vaccinated. There are people mm -hmm. who can't get the vaccine, the, you know, children can't get the vaccine and so forth. And so I think, um, you know, I, I think it's reasonable, a reasonable recommendation, especially since we're still learning about this variant and how fast it spreads. Okay. Well, thank you. This has all been, uh, this has been a really good time to kind of talk about all the various issues, whether it's in space or um, to COVID. Um, so thank you for taking the time. This is oh, it was, really it was, awesome. It was, it was fun. You, you, you came in as very well prepared, I must say. You, you know a lot. Well, thank you. Like and I said, I... Like I said, it's a it's a pleasure reading your stuff at Ordinary Times, and uh, 
I was more than happy to participate. Well, great, great. Well, again, thank you very much. And um, we'll hope to talk to you again. All right, I'd be delighted to. Okay. All right, take care. Take care. so thankful for the time that I had to chat with Michael. One of the things I think that I that I really got from that discussion is how important the unmanned programs are to people. Um, that those programs can actually inspire people to go into um, into the field of science. Uh, it's not just the quote unquote sexy missions like going to the moon or to Mars. Um, it's even those those missions that may not always get the attention, but are just as every as just as important um, to the study of the world around us. Uh, I wanted to also share a bit of, of a trivia question. I at the beginning of this, I start. I told you that I watched the um, flight of the uh, the first flight of the Enterprise, which was the test shuttle. Um, it never flew into a low Earth orbit, though there were some attempts um, to retrofit it at some point. Um, but of course, its name is Enterprise, and actually. It is, as you would think, named after the Starship Enterprise and Star Trek, but that was not the original name. The original name for um, this ship was going to be, I believe, Constitution. It was going to be the, um, since it, w it was being wheeled out, it was introduced in 1976, 76 being the bicentennial year, it was going to be, um, that was going to be its name. But it ended up, um, there were a lot of people that wanted it to be named Enterprise, and um, they, NASA listened. So, regarding our talk with Jeff Bezos, I want to add one thing. There were four people on the flight. There was Bezos, there was his brother, there was a, a teenager from the Netherlands, um, and there was one other person on board, um, New Shepard. Um, also on board was an 82-year-old woman from Texas, Wally Funk. But Wally was no ordinary space tourist. She was one of the Mercury 13. That was a group of women who took tests that I believe were identical to the Mercury 7 astronauts. And they did this they, on, in the hopes that NASA would allow women into the space program. Now, the 13 were never accepted, and it wasn't until the 70s that NASA finally accepted women. Wally and a number of the women in that group applied again and again over the years, and they were rejected by NASA over and over. But on July 20th, 2021, her dream of going into space became a reality. Um, she had the short jaunt into space, and that made her the oldest person to go into space, breaking John Glenn's record set in 1998. There are only two survivors, uh, two people who are still living of the original Mercury 13, Funk being one of them. And so far, she's the only one that went into space. But I'd like to think, as she took off on January 20th and into, into, into space. And as she had those maybe few moments of weightlessness, I have to think that her ride wasn't just for her, but it was also for her uh, fellow sisters who never had the chance. 
And I'm thankful that she was able to do that. So I want to say congratulations, Wally. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I am very thankful for your support. Uh, make sure that you visit our website. While you're there, you can sign up for um, to be on the mailing list of our new newsletter, which is called Letters of Transit. And the way that I'm writing it is trying to write it more and less in a kind of journal style. So um, sign up and you can follow it, um, follow along. While you're at the website, you can also listen to past episodes and read some other of my articles. And you can also make a donation to support this podcast. And as I said at the beginning of the podcast, don't forget to subscribe to whatever platform that you listen to, whether that is Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or whatever else. And don't forget that we are also on YouTube. Wherever you listen to this, please consider leaving a rating or written review. It is, as I said, very important, and I would be incredibly thankful if you did that. That's it for this episode of En Route, Notes on Religion, Politics, and Culture. I'm Dennis Sanders. Take care, and Godspeed.